they see commander. We are allowed to decide not to come. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that um, kind introduction. Um, I'll just get my screen share on. Um, Peter, can you tell me if the screen share is working and if you can see the slide view? Yeah, yep, exactly. There's yep. you on the side as well, so okay. you look the same in both photos. Yeah, well, I wasn't sure if I was going to have to um, have a pre-recorded one, if the tech was going to work, but it appears to be working today. Um, you can't see my notes here, can you? You can just see the actual screen. Sorry, I can't oh, I can see, see what... Your notes. No, I'm just joking. Uh, oh, you know, it's God. perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, I can't see what you can see, so I just like to check. All right, okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. Um, thanks for that awesome introduction. Um, actually, Lorena's talk was a really good introduction to my talk. Um, Lorena's been really helpful in, in the Floribank guidelines, along with a lot of other people. Um, and we're really doing this project to try and build seed awareness, or what Martin Driver and I are calling seed literacy. Um, I think I probably don't need to even do the first couple of slides, because Lorena is actually you know, highlighted a lot of the issues that we have in the seed issue, uh, the seed industry, um, illegal collection, um, people who are not properly trained, um, insufficient genetic diversity. Um, so anyway, um, back to my talk. Thanks for joining me. I'm speaking from Perth today on Wajak Noongar Budja. I really would have liked to have been in Darwin. Um, I was just really scared that I was going to get stuck in Darwin and not allowed back into WA. Um, otherwise, I would have been there. So today I'm going to talk about the Floribank guidelines. These are national guidelines for best practice, native seed collection and use. I'm going to talk to you about what's in this new edition and why everyone involved in seed based restoration should read them, whether they touch a seed or not, um, even if they're involved in any part um, of the, um, the seed industry. Um, so there are a variety of restoration approaches and team told us about um, some of these different approaches yesterday. Depends on the landscape context, depends on whether plants can re-sprout, uh, whether seeds can disperse into the area or whether they can recruit from the soil seed bank. Um, so in those cases you can do natural regeneration, but in some circumstances and also for some species, plants actually need to be returned through planting or seeding. So this graphic shows this really simplified seed supply chain starting with the decisions on which species to select and where to collect the seeds from. Then that's followed by seed collecting. And these seeds can be used in seed production areas to increase seed availability and also decrease pressure on wild populations. Then seeds need to be processed to extract the seeds from fruits often and to remove the chaff and non-seed material. Seed can be tested before it's dried and stored. And then these storage conditions depend on how long the seeds need to be stored for before they're used either for propagating seedlings in a nursery, for planting out or direct seeding. But of course, once the plants and seeds are in the ground, restoration doesn't stop there. So monitoring and adaptive management are all really important aspects of seed-based restoration so that we can all continually improve our practices. Now, there might be one organisation responsible for taking seed through this supply chain, but more commonly, it might change hands several times. Um, and I think this is really important as well to understand in the seed supply chain that it's not, um, you know, some people have a really good understanding of the whole supply chain, um, whereas others might be interacting just with one part of it. But it's really important to kind of have this holistic view. So seed management raises a lot of questions. So where do we get the seeds from? Are there enough seeds from enough species? Do we need permissions? Um, what's the quality? Should we pre-treat? How do we store? How do we sow? And seed management also presents a lot of issues. So I encourage you to read the Australian Native Seed Survey Report, which is available on the ANPC website for free, um, to have a look at some of the issues within the industry. Now, because there are lots of decisions to make in seed-based restoration, we need guidelines to help us navigate these decisions and also to collate and communicate current best practice. So that's where the Floribank Guidelines comes in. It's designed as a best practice guide for native seed collection and use. Now, the set of 10 guidelines was written around 1999 and 2000. I'm so sorry that I can't see the room, but maybe for those, if anyone's listening to me, could you just put your hands up if you've actually read and used the first edition um, and have a look around? I'm just curious to know. Um, um, I mean, 
I've been using it for a number of years, pretty much and since. Pardon? There's a 10 out of about 25 people. Oh, great. Okay. So that's 10 people who are definitely going to be reading the second edition. And then that's 25 who are going to be starting with the second edition. So that's great. Thanks, Peter. Um, so Florabank was a partnership between Greening Australia, CSIRO and Australian National Botanic Gardens. Um, and it was funded through the Bush Care Program at that time. But since the first edition, there's been over 20 years of experience and research on lots of different topics, but especially seed germination um, and new research on provenance. There's also been a lot of seed production areas established and lots more new equipment and technology. So that's why we are in need of an update. Now, the second edition, which I've been working on for about the last 18 months, has been funded by the New South Wales Government through its Environmental Trust. It's part of the Healthy Seeds Project, which is a consortium of ANPC, so the Australian Network for Plant Conservation, and seven other organisations. The target audience for the guidelines is basically anyone involved in the seed supply chain. So collectors, land care, people in mining, and native plant nurseries. And I guess Lorena just put it really well as that amazing example of why people in the mining industry, for example, actually need to understand about seeds. Um, but it's also other people involved with the seed supply chain. So people involved in licensing, um, anyone using seeds in an experimental context, like ecologists. Um, and it's also, um, I think it's gonna be really useful to inform people about parts of the seed supply chain they might not be familiar with. For instance, those who are planning restoration or who are purchasing seed really need to understand the whole context. So this is our update process. Uh, first of all, we formed a reference group and then we listed um, all the new modules that are in the second edition. So some of the original modules we actually merged together um, because the original version wasn't written all at once. It was actually written sequentially. Um, we were able to sort of restart, I guess, um, and put the, the new modules in a, in a logical order. Um, so we split some modules, we developed some new modules, and we also invited lots of authors representing different parts of the seed sector. And I'm so grateful for all those amazing people who've given so much of their time and expertise to help out. Then we drafted the modules, we sent them to review, um, and it was fantastic that some people who weren't able to be co-authors were able to review, and we got people reviewing for across the world. Then we address the reviews, proofread the modules. And this week, really excitingly, um, we have sent all the modules off to the graphic designer. So we're hoping to be able to launch the guidelines maybe in around eight weeks or so. Yeah, it's been, I'm really happy about the number of people that we've been able to involve in the process. Um, people who've given a lot of time and expertise, they've been just really generous, generous with their time and also their knowledge. Now, the first edition had 10 modules, as I said. So some of the topics included cleaning, storage, and testing. And in the second edition, we've combined some of the modules together. We've split one module in two um, and others we've kind of kept intact. And then we've also, uh, we've also got several new modules, taking the total now to 15. So these new modules include working with Indigenous Australians, approvals, principles and standards, enhancement technologies, nursery propagation, direct seeding, and also a module to help those buying and selling seeds. It's really interesting um, that a lot of people who are like a seed procurement officer um, might have come from a completely different background. Maybe a, not a, they're not a, an ecologist, um, they might be a mine planner, um, or they might be um, from a main roads department. And we really wanted to give them some tips and tricks on what to do when they're purchasing seed. We've also got a whole lot of new photos and diagrams as well, um, which is really great. And they're all Australian, so it's all an Australian context. Now, the structure of the modules in the second edition largely follows the seed supply chain. These first four modules that you can see in the screen on green, um, they are some of the information that supports the seed supply chain. So the introduction sets a bit of a context, working with Indigenous Australians, approvals, principles and standards and record keeping. And these really apply to all of the other modules. And then modules five to 14 basically follow the seed supply chain. And then the last module, like I said, actually relates back to all of the modules and provides tips for purchases. So purchases could actually start there 
and then go back to some of the other modules to find out more details. So here are a few of the key messages from the guidelines. Um, the introduction really talks about the importance of um, how seed collection should have minimal impact on wild populations and make sure that seeds are high quality um, and sourced appropriately. Then the next module talks a lot about Indigenous partnerships and the importance of getting permission when accessing Indigenous managed lands to collect seeds. Then the module on licensing um, explains about how licensing should help to protect and maintain plant populations and how people really need to make sure that they actually have the right permissions um, that they source their seeds legally. And then um, quality and quality record keeping is really important for all of the aspects in the supply chain. Now, the objective of the provenance strategy, which we've talked about in the seed sourcing module, is to um, have a seed sourcing strategy that delivers long-term and also short-term success in a changing environment. And we've outlined a number of the different seed sourcing strategies that people can use. Then in the collection module, we've got tips and tricks for collecting seed production areas. Um, we've outlined a lot of the different types of seed production areas that you can have, and also how you really need to consider which species you're going to have in a seed production area, because some are maybe more suitable than others. The seed processing module talks about how to process seed to reduce the volume of the seed lot to be stored. Um, and then the drying, seed drying and storage module talks about not only how important it is to store seeds under cool, constant temperatures, but also to make sure that seeds are actually dry as well. And the storage conditions, are, like I said, relate to the end use of the seeds and how long you need to store these seeds for. Then in the quality testing module, we explain how to test purity, seed fill and viability. And then in the germination and dormancy section, we talk about requirements for seed germination and how this can improve success of propagation. Seed enhancement technologies is a really new and emerging area and we've had some great authors talking about um, some of their experiences and what you can do to enhance seed delivery, germination and performance. Then in nursery propagation, um, we are talking about when you should consider propagating seeds in the nursery rather than direct seeding. So if you've got very few seeds or perhaps seeds with poor quality um, or complex dormancy and they take a really long time to germinate, you might want to consider propagating them in the nursery. And then finally, we've got a module on seed um, direct seeding and a description of all the different types of seeding machinery that's available. So thanks. Um, that's really the end of my talk. Um, a huge thanks again for the enormous amount of in-kind support. Please get a copy of the guidelines when they're published. Um, this is really my one take home message. Um, make sure that you download the guidelines. They'll be free and online and provide the guidelines to trainees and students and volunteers and seed purchasing officers. If you want to educate other people about seeds, uh, please make sure that you pass the guidelines on to others. Um, I think that we're, um, these guidelines are going to be really great, this update to improve seed literacy across the sector. Um, and it's also really useful to people who are already doing best practice because they can use these guidelines to show that they are doing best practice. Um, thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions now or online. I'm sure there'll be questions. Say that. Indeed, I'm correct. Thanks very much, Lucy. Dave Carr here. Uh, Hi, Dave. The, uh, um, the guidelines have been referenced by government departments in New South Wales and I presume other states as well. Uh, when they come up in tenders all the time as you know, you must follow flora bank guidelines. You must, um, you know, comply with these these guidelines. Uh, has uh, has the consortium had any discussions with with government about sort of formalising that sort of relationship, or do you see that these are these are now uh, a standard for seed collection that uh, governments or agencies or mining companies could use to uh, specify how seed should be collected? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously they're non-mandatory guidelines. So we're just providing best practice guidelines and we're providing information for everybody to use. 
Um, we've had a lot of people in government contribute to the guidelines. We've actually even had people in licensing write sections of the licensing guidelines. So um, I guess by involving a lot of different people in writing the guidelines, we're hoping that you know, they kind of take ownership and they might use it within their organisations, whether that's government or non-government organisations. Um, in terms of trying to encourage it to be used um, um, as more mandatory standards, um, I guess that's not really up to me, but all we can do is have those conversations um, with the relevant people um, and see how they might be able to take uh, parts out of it and use it um, within... Um, I guess, yeah, within, like you said, those tenders and agreements and things like that. I mean, we actually had really good success with the last publication I did with ANPC, the translocation guidelines. Um, within a couple of months, it was in the, the new translocation guidelines was referenced in New South Wales translocation policy. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm hopeful that um, the uptake will be good and we'll be doing a lot of promotion and publicity and educating the sector um, to try and get uptake as well. And I guess, I mean, because, you know, maybe 50% of the audience, not quite 50% today are already um, using the first edition. Um, I guess that means that hopefully they will then take up the second edition as well. Any other questions? Yep, coming up. Thank you. Um, this might not be in your remit, so apologies if you can't answer this one. But I was just following on Sorry, from that. can I ask who's speaking? Sorry, Sorry it's see. Alistair Jones um, from Corporate Carbon. Hi, Alistair. Hi. Um, I was just going to ask, following on from that, whether through your kind of consultation and discussion, there had been any conversations around like a certification or an industry body or something like that? Um, to give us, like people who subcontract out a lot of this work, I guess some more confidence in the operators in the industry or, um, yeah, whether any of those conversations have been had? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And yes, we have been talking about that. So in Western Australia, um, where I am, we have RIAWA, the Revegetation Industry Association of Western Australia, and they actually have a seed collector accreditation program. So people can do a training course, become accredited, and basically have a stamp, you know, on their business that says they've become accredited. Um, that's only in Western Australia. Um, so, but I know that people are looking at that process um, to be perhaps um, rolled out across Australia. Through the Project Phoenix um, discussions that we've been having, I think Lorena mentioned these as well, we have been talking about having a national code of practice that's more mandatory. Um, Flora Bank actually has a code of practice, which we are updating, but it's non-mandatory at the moment. So um, that's another, um, another aspect that, you know, if people kind of signed up to this code of practice, um, then yes, purchasers might have a bit more confidence that they're doing the right thing, you know, they're collecting without having a huge impact on populations. Um, and they're also, um, you know, providing the source location and making sure that the seeds are contained, like obtained legally. Um, so um, in the meantime, um, given that we don't have these mandatory standards um, at the moment, I think the best thing that seed purchasers can do is read module 15 of the guidelines and go through. Um, and it's got a whole lot of tips and tricks on what to ask seed collectors, like, you know, ask them for their license number, make sure that the seeds have been obtained legally and you're not buying an illegal product. Um, make sure that you're asking for some quality information as well. So um, short answer, yes, those conversations are being had. Uh, no, there is no mandatory standard or accreditation process in Australia as yet. Um, so in the meantime, read the Fuller Bank guidelines. <laughs> Any Hi, other Lucy. questions? G'day Lucy, Steve Field. Hi Steve. Good to see you. Great talk. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you. I was wondering, is there is there a, a lead on for presenters like myself and Dave? Is there an accreditation process for that to become presenters or you know to become trainers in in this? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's actually probably not something I know the answer to. So Project Phoenix is actually having a look at the old Flora Bank training, 
um, and they are developing a new training program. How people would become accredited and run it, I don't know. So that's actually a question for Project Phoenix, but I can put you in touch with Sam and the rest of the Project Phoenix team and they will be able to answer that for you. I'm sorry, I don't know. That's great, Lucy. Um, we're right at time, so if anyone can join in thanking Lucy again. Thanks very much. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. Feel free to email me if you've got any more questions.